Hello, everyone. Welcome to this seminar series on myeloma. Um, this, this has been a very important seminar that we do every year, um, providing information about the disease, the treatments, outcomes, and most importantly now, the hope and the progress that we have made um, with all various research on the clinical side, in the, in the lab side, and, and, and the incredible progress that, that we are at the cusp of cure in this disease. So I'm going to start with what I would call myeloma 101 or myeloma ABC, um, about diagnosis, how to prognosticate the disease, and also um, about how we're moving forward, utilize some of these to decide on the treatment. Now, these are my disclosures. Uh, now, diagnosis of myeloma for 50 years has been based on understanding three things. Doing blood tests, we look at protein. We do bone marrow and look at myeloma cells. And then we look at the bone lesions by doing the x-rays that you see on the right side. That's been still the standard. We still do this. But there are more newer technologies and techniques we use to better define or refine our treatment. This includes what is called light chain measurements, and you have seen those before or probably have had it, had it been done before. We do fish testing for the genomics of the disease. We do MRI and PET scan, and now doing this very incredible um, genomic technology with whole genome sequencing and transcriptome sequencing to uh, further understand the disease, and I will explain some of it. So if we come to the first point, which is um, how do we diagnose myeloma? There are three, again, things that we do. We do blood testing, urine, and bone marrow. Now in blood, we'll do perform tests to quantitate the myeloma protein because the level of protein tells us how much myeloma is there in the body. And if it's patient is responding, the protein goes down, we measure those things. And these are the numbers that you will hear about and you, you're gonna follow this over time. So it's good to know what those numbers are called. So one of the first numbers that you will hear about is called M spike or monoclonal spike. Quite, quite often patients call it myeloma spike. This is the protein in the blood, looks like this in our test, we measure it and you get a number. This is one number that we'll try to bring to zero. The second is when we quantitated the disease by looking at subtype of protein. It's a type of called immunoglobulin. And this also determines the type of myeloma you have. So you might hear IgG myeloma or IgA myeloma. It comes from this. And the level of IgG matches what the disease burden or disease status is. And we measure that. And then we measure 24-hour urine for what is called Ben Jones protein. It is still done at least in the beginning and periodically during the treatment follow-up. We now begin to do serum free light chain, which I'm going to mention in a minute. But this is one of the important tests that we have been doing now for the last 10 to 15 years as a standard practice. Presence of protein constitutes one part of the diagnosis. The second part is, is the bone marrow showing myeloma cells there? And when we do bone marrow, we see under microscope cells like this, which are important, but we also do more fancier tests to define is it kappa type of myeloma or lambda type of myeloma and quantitate them and that's done here. And between the bone marrow and the blood and urine test, we decide there are myeloma cells in the bone marrow and there is protein in the blood. And that constitute diagnosis of plasma cell disorder. It does not make the diagnosis of myeloma, but plasma cell disorder. Now, one of the new tests that I mentioned is the measurement of pre light chain. And this is done in blood. It was supposed to replace the original 24-hour urine test, but it has not. So we still do it, urine testing periodically. But as far as this test is concerned, um, we routinely now do it at every stage of the disease from diagnosis, response, evaluation, to relapse and prognosis. And it is an important component. So you'll have this number also available. Myeloma is only one of the two types, either kappa or lambda, not both. And so that's one of the numbers we follow. Now, from prognosis point of view, this light chain is important. 
because in patients have a early disease, the monoclonal gammopathy, this is where we measure the free life chain. And we are able to determine, is this MGUS going to progress to myeloma soon or it's not going to take very, or it's going to take a very long time. And so there are three features we identify, M spike, non-IgG myeloma and free light chain, if the, all three are present, then in 20 years, there is 60% chance patient may get myeloma. So we follow this patient more frequently every six months or so. But if they're all negative, then the chance is 5%. It's almost baseline. We don't need to follow patients sometimes even once a year, quite often the primary care physician follow them. And then intermediate remains intermediate, 20 to 40%. And we follow every year or so. On the smoldering myeloma side, there are three different features. If three, all three are patients, then these smoldering myeloma patients progress 75% of the time, they progress within five years. And, and, and these are the patients where we're doing a lot of research to see how we can prevent the progression or are these the patients who we should be treating as myeloma? So we have to keep that in mind. If only one of the three features are present, chance of progression is only 25%. And and, and and then over 10 to 15 years, some of these patients never progress to myeloma. And we need to just follow and not treat these patients. Even, even in research, currently we don't make any changes. Now, knowing that there is a protein in blood and or urine and the bone marrow is involved, when can we call a patient as a myeloma that now needs treatment? Or when patient is in early stage disease, either MGUS or smoldering that I mentioned, where we don't need to do the treatment. This is determined by, are there what we call end organ damage? Has myeloma affected the body? If it has not affected the body, then we don't need to treat. And the effect on the body that we look for is high calcium, kidney dysfunction, anemia, or having bone lesion. So if patient does not have any of this, then those are called smoldering myeloma or MGUS. We don't treat them unless on a study. If any one of this is present, that's active myeloma, that we, then we start treatment for what we call regular myeloma. So this is how we decide which patient to treat, when do we treat them. Now, how do we detect this end organ damage? Quite simple. Um, we do blood tests, and, and by blood test, we look at blood counts to see if there's anemia or not. And we do chemistry, to see if patient has kidney problem or not, or if calcium is high or not. So that's my blood test. For the bone disease, we need to do some imaging studies. Now, we do not do bone scan in the traditional way that cancer doctors do. We still currently do plain x-rays, what is called skeletal survey. It's low sensitivity, but if present, it clearly confirms diagnosis of myeloma. However, because it's low sensitivity, in the new modern world, we perform two of the newer standard testing. Either we do whole body MRI, it's more difficult, or we do PET scan, which is more common, more simpler. They are high sensitivity and or specificity, and they diagnose the disease very clearly. So if somebody is a smoldering myeloma, I would do PET scan to see, is there any clear bone or other disease organ involved? and presence of that would mean we need to treat this patient. I will give an example. So this is an MRI. This is normal MRI where you can see the bone marrow is dark in color. But when somebody has myeloma, the bone marrow is infiltrated by myeloma. You can see the color becoming lighter here. Some patients have a mixture of light and dark, which is called nodular disease. There are spots, foci of the disease, and sometimes there's a mixture of both. So this is what we look for MRI. We do PET scan. PET scans light up like this. So all these dark nodes, dots, are myeloma. And we can look at it in all different ways, all different colors. Now, that can this can detect disease anywhere in the body. We do whole body, so that's an advantage. And it is important that especially when myeloma doesn't make too much protein, PET scan is very helpful in diagnosis. And we use it for response. So when patients get treatment, this particular patient got a very effective treatment. Um, within six months' time, you could see that all the dots have disappeared. And this is one we want the 
pets can to change to clean, no disease, no spot. And, and so this is also utilized for response color. Now, in the newer world, we have slight changes in the definition, and I don't want you to be confused with it, but now we do bone marrow and look for, are there lots of myeloma cells in the bone marrow? If it is more than 6%, we call it myeloma and start treating patients. If the free light chain ratio is very high, but the free light chains are very high, we don't necessarily start treatment, but we think about it very seriously. And, in, and if there is a bone lesion by MRI or even PET scan, we begin to utilize as a diagnosis of myeloma and treat this patient. So that's what how we manage this patient. Now, this is the diagnosis of myeloma. The second component is staging. So what staging means, everybody asks, what is the, my myeloma stage? What is my cancer stage? So in myeloma, the stage does not matter tremendously, like in breast and lung cancer it does, partly because every patient does well, even stage three does well, but we still have stage. And its staging is done by simple blood test, bone marrow examination, and sometimes in the research setting, novel things. So why do we do this prognostication and staging? Sometimes to consider treatment, sometimes to consider the long-term treatment, maintenance treatment, et cetera. It tells us how patient is going to do over a period of long time so we can decide whether to give more aggressive, less aggressive treatments. And on the research side, we do staging so that we can find new drugs, new targets that we can manage all these aggressive diseases better. So one staging is called ISS staging system. Very simple blood test. We do measure albumin and globulin and, and, and uh, sorry, beta to microglobulin. And it tells us ISS stage one patients in general do better, ISS stage three do not as well. But, and, and this has been important, is, is an important part of what we do. The second component is to look for what we call cytogenetics in fish, the chromosomal changes in myeloma cells. There are many you could see in this mixture of colors means pieces of chromosomes have changed. For practical purpose, we do what is called fish examination, and, and we identify certain changes which are considered high-risk features. Deletion 17P is one example. E414 is another example. And then there are a few other changes. If that is present, we put patient in the high-risk category where we do a little more intense treatment. We, could, we do two drug maintenance, et cetera. And my colleagues who are going to talk about treatment will mention all this in future. I'm happy to take questions if you have. And, and then the rest of the changes, including chromosome 13 change or 11, 14, they are standard risk. Those are not high risk diseases, and we treat them in a standard fashion. So this risk stratification is important in deciding how aggressive the myeloma is and how best we treat these patient populations. Now, to give an example, um, T414 myeloma is considered high risk. But when we use bortezomib as a treatment, you could see that these two curves, they come to clo closer. Um, the, the, the green curve is those who do not have T414, the red one is patients who have T414. And you could see that when patients are getting bortezomib, these curves, meaning patient survival is similar in those who have 414 or those who do not. So we do our improve our outcome. Similarly, if you look at lenalidomide, another drug, in 414 patients, the curves are become overlapping. So lenalidomide might help this patient improve their outcome. But in 17P, the curves are separated, which tells us that by itself, it's not adequate. And this is how we do study to decide how do we treat the aggressive disease even better than what we have been doing. Now, question ends up, we do this prognostication with simple thing. In future, how can we do better? So we're using all these norm, newer technologies of whole genome sequencing and what we call whole transcriptome sequence, et cetera, and come up with new algorithm to define iris disease and then move forward. One example, what is called gene expression profile divides patients into three groups. You could see the lower the curve means patients are not doing as well. Higher the curve means patients are doing well. So you could see that group of patients, the red curve, are not doing as well, and they are defined by this gene expression profile. This is still in sort of a research setting, but it works very well, and we are beginning to use in some of our traditional way. 
And just to explain the complexity of the research, this gene expression profile is one part of the myeloma genome that we look at, or the myeloma genes we look at. But in really in the cell, in the cancer cell, there are a lot of other things that are happening. There's a DNA, there is splicing, there's protein, methylation, epigenome, all sorts of buzzwords that you may hear. They all lead to impacting how myeloma cells might proliferate and not. So we have done genome sequencing at a very high level. And we have identified certain mutations called KRAS, NRAS, BRAF. They are frequent, but not super frequent. They're in 20% of the patients. Not, not, no single mutation is present in every patient. So we need to do this quite reproducibly. Uh, on an average, there are 58 mutations in proteins that various proteins we see. So it's quite frequent. The importance is that certain mutations can be targeted by drugs. So this V600A mutation, BRAF, that we observe in myeloma, there's a drug that can be targeted for this specific mutation. So this particular patient got this drug called Vemurafenib, and his myeloma came down very quickly, within a month. Very good response with this one single patient, with single drug. The, the tumor became smaller in size, and we did all these biopsies, and we can see the tumor response was very good. And so utilizing some specific drug for specific mutation is coming up and will be utilized even more as we understand it better. The second way for us to now manage this patient and, and, and inch towards a cure is to do what is called minimal residual disease monitoring. So using genomic technique, we can now measure even very few myeloma cells, if they are present or not. And our goal is that we remove even a single myeloma cell from the bone marrow. If we do that, it won't come back and patient is cured. So this method that we use um, measure, can measure now myeloma at a great depth. So this measure in, in the current, in the past, last year, when we do bone marrow and look at it under microscope, we can see one myeloma cell in 100. That's our ability. Now, using this sequencing-based method, we can now measure one myeloma cell in a million. It can, it, it is, our sensitivity is increased 10,000 times. And so now if we do bone marrow and there is not a single cell in a million cell, that means there is very little myeloma left. And that's where the newer treatments are heading towards. We do treatment to get patients to MRD negativity. We can measure it very routinely using these techniques. And to give an example, if, if patients who are MRD negative, the rate curve, those patients do superbly well in our studies. The blue curve is MRD positive, they are not doing as well. They still do well, but not as well. And, and that's for all sorts of survival outcomes. And so to be in the rate curve, we need to give enough treatment, long enough treatment or severe enough treatment to get them to MRD negativity. And there is something more to it. The getting MRD negativity does not need one or other treatment. Whatever treatment gets you there will give a good outcome. So this was one of our study where we did half of the patients got transplant and half did not get transplant. Now on both the sides, if patients did get MRD negativity, they are doing very similarly. Didn't matter you got transplant. If you do not get MRD negativity, then patients who got transplant are doing better. Those who did not get transplant are not doing as well. So it is the MRD negativity matters, not how you get there. That's one important point to keep in mind as we develop treatments. And the second point is that I talked about high-risk disease not doing as well, et cetera. So the patient in red at the high-risk disease, patient in blue are standard risk. The curves are overlapping. Why? because these are the MRD negative patients. So if you get MRD negativity, these patients are doing very, very well. If you don't get MRD negativity, then the standard risk, the green curve do better, the high risk don't do better as well so, so much. So the point being that our now future effort is to get patients with high risk to get an MRD negativity. So that's another test we do on the bone marrow once the treatment starts. MRD measurements. And then finally, the point to keep in mind that myeloma cells, when we do this whole genome sequence, we see 
lots of mutation. In, in whole genome sequence, we see around 10,000 mutation in a given patient's myeloma cell. All these dots here, that's one mut one dot is one mutation, all sorts of changes. This is a diagnosis in one patient. When this patient relapses, you could see that the density of the dots have increased. The 10,000 mutations have now become 15,000 mutations. And all these chromosomal changes also increase from um, 50 to 600. So significant increase in all different mutational changes. And this is how myeloma cells survive the treatment. And this is how it can become resistant. So because of this kind of change, what is becoming now important in myeloma is that not to go after one dot, but to try to cover all the bases. And this is where the beginning of our immunotherapy comes. You're going to hear a lot of talk in this seminar series on immunotherapy. But I will just highlight the current thing, current important points. So one of the things we also do in myeloma patient now is to study the immune status and immune responses. So we look at various immune cell types, what are called B cell, T cell, and K cell. And we now know that there are certain B cell and T cells that don't function normally. That's why myeloma patients have a little bit suppressed immune system. So one of our efforts is to increase the immune system so uh, our immunotherapy works better, the other therapies work better. So we studied this quite significantly. And there are two types of immune problems we observe in myeloma. One is the immune changes helps myeloma. So there are certain cells called plasmacytic dendritic cell or monocytic component they actually my help myeloma grow further, the TH17 cell. On the other end, there are certain immune responses which are anti-myeloma. These immune responses are known to kill myeloma cells. And what myeloma cell does, and what happens in patients, is that these kind of immune responses are suppressed. And so our effort is to increase them so that the immune system can kill myeloma cells. And we have developed a lot of immunotherapeutic approaches over the years to achieve this. Now, um, there, there is one type of immune treatment called active immunity. We have drugs like lenalidomide, which I'm sure some of you have received. We have antigen-based therapies. Uh, we have some peptide-based therapy, immunotherapy ongoing, etc. These are all active immunotherapy. The one which has been most effective currently is the passive immunotherapy, which is where we use antibodies and drug-based antibodies, and you will hear a lot about it, daratumumab, Isotoximab, ilotuzumab, and then uh, belentimab. Those are the active uh, antibody-based treatments. And then adaptive is where the greatest promise in the recent past has been. And I'm sure all of you have heard about it. It's the CAR T cell-based therapies. And we and others have developed a lot of it. And what it basically means is that we take cells from your blood, from patient's blood. We manipulate it in a way to make them activate we, we give them some properties so they can identify cancer cells and we give those cells back. They go into patient's body and kill myeloma cells. So one of the most effective has been CAR T cells. CAR T cells are again produced in a, a very similar way, the genetic manipulation. What happens is that we exploit the properties of the T cells, the immune cells to kill cancer cells. But T cells in general don't recognize myeloma cells very specifically. So what we do is we use a viral vector and this vector is put into the T cells in our lab. And because of that, the T cells starts expressing these specific molecules on their surface. They go in patient's blood and the bone marrow, bind to myeloma cells, and then kills it. It's as simple as that. In the process, because of the properties we are given to T cells, they grow further and they become stronger. And then they kill more, they, they increase in number and kill more myeloma cells. And so it requires all this production, infusion, etc. And you're going to hear more about this later on. The point I want to make it that this is the promise of the immunotherapy. We measure in the lab when you present and at a later time, usually for research now, but also beginning to do it more routinely. But there's a whole process of T cell collection, generation adoptive transfer, and patient monitoring. And what does it achieve? It achieves great responses, very high responses. And the one example I will show you here, a patient within one month of getting CAR T cells, 
you can see the pets can become totally negative. The bone marrow cleared. And this is the patient around four months from the time when the patient had very serious disease with bone pains and all sorts of problems, getting CAR T cells on a ski slopes. So it not only controls myeloma, but also provides good quality of life. And there are two CAR T cells which are now commercially available. Idacel, 81% response rate. Siltacel in one of the big study, 98% response rate, both commercially available. You're gonna hear a lot about this in, in the coming time. But the summary of what my talk so far is, there has been a tremendous excitement about the treatment. Many more new treatments have come about in all this time. There are many more still in the works. We are working on a lot of newer things. The bone marrow you give is part of our uh, normal evaluation. And, and as we take your permission to use it for research, it goes into developing this technology. So, so very thankful for providing um, support uh, with bone marrow, blood samples, and everything else. And, and this is where we are almost about to cure this disease to make it um, chronic disease. So thank you so much, and happy to take any questions um, offline, online, and otherwise. Um, thank you.